thanks for coming. I'm Antonia Juhas. Um, I am in the midst of um, what has been a really exciting tour for um, Black Tide, my new book. And it has taken me from London uh, at BP's annual shareholder meeting to New York and DC and Portland and Olympia and here and then I'll go on to Boulder and Denver back to the Bay Area and it's been um, quite an experience. It was quite an experience to write this book. Um, anyone who is familiar with my previous books, The Bush Agenda and The Tyranny of Oil, knows that my focus or my, the, my writing style has primarily been policy. My background is public policy. I've worked for two members of Congress. Uh, my master's is in public policy. I work with the Institute for Policy Studies. I do policy. And when this disaster happened or when the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon happened, um, I was actually in Houston for Chevron's annual shareholder meeting and I had gone there, I'd helped bring together what we call ourselves as the true cost of Chevron network, which is people from all around the world who live in places where Chevron operates, uh, whether that's uh, Angola, or people had come from Angola, Nigeria, Kazakhstan, Alaska, Mississippi, um, Ecuador, from all over the world, um, Australia, did I say Australia? To come to go into Chevron shareholder meeting and to tell Chevron shareholders what it means to live in the places where Chevron operates. And we were there, and it had been at that point a couple weeks since the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon, and it was very much a part of the dialogue that we were engaged in in thinking about oil companies and oil operations. And we decided after the shareholder meeting to go down to the Gulf with our allies from the Gulf, from Mississippi, from Texas, to see uh, for ourselves. And the first thing I realized upon arriving in the Gulf was that even as someone who is a policy expert on oil and has written on oil for a very long time and has thought about offshore drilling for a very long time, that this was something completely different than what we thought it was going to be. That even though the industry had promised us that it knew what to do, when it drilled offshore, that it knew what to do when it drilled deep offshore. What we learned by several weeks into the disaster was that they didn't. They hadn't planned or prepared or had the technology available to deal with the deep water blowout. And worse than that, or maybe not worse than that, but in addition to that, they absolutely did not know how to deal with the spill at all. And so when we went down there, we saw that it had been several weeks and nothing was happening. <laughs> they didn't know how to cap it. They didn't know how to clean it. They weren't prepared to capture the oil. They weren't prepared to boom the oil. They weren't pre prepared to protect the Gulf. All these things that they said that they knew how to do. And when I say they, I mean every single oil company, not a single one knew what to do because all the major oil companies operate in the Gulf of Mexico all of them sat down at a table together and said, oh, geez, I know we said we knew what to do, but oh my gosh, do you? Because, and they didn't. So we got down there, and I had already written a couple articles uh, in response to the disaster. But once I arrived, I realized this, this wasn't going to end anytime soon, and getting information was going to be way more difficult than I had anticipated. Because when we got down there, we also couldn't actually go down there. We couldn't go to beaches. Couldn't go and see the oil. We couldn't walk around. Couldn't interview people. Couldn't talk to people. And that was being imposed by county sheriffs, private security that worked for BP. It was the local government. It was the federal government. It was the corporation. And we weren't going to be able to tell the story the way we wanted. And I realized that I needed to write um, a book, a full-length book to tell the story, and that it was going to require more than just a short trip, I was going to need to spend an awful lot of time uh, in the Gulf Coast to really tell this. But the other piece of this and where I began with it from a policy perspective was I also realized very quickly that this wasn't going to be able to be a policy um, book. This was a book about people and places and, and events that were very human and very gut-wrenching and very, um, very much about people telling their stories. and 
I was overwhelmed from the very beginning of the generosity of the people that I encountered who were going through the most difficult experiences of their lives but were willing to open up their homes and I stayed in people's homes and I played with their kids and I went to their churches and I played on their beaches and I went to their workplaces and I went on their boats when they weren't afraid that they would get fined $40,000 for taking me on their boat. Um, which you were when you got too close to boom at a certain period of time, you would get charged $40,000. Um, and they let me tell this story. And um, it made it so that this was a very, this is a very special book for me. It, it's, a, it's a book I really love that's really close to my heart. And I also, of course, had to write it very quickly because it had to come out now. And now, the importance of now is this is the one year anniversary. So April 20th, 2010 is the day that the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig exploded and 11 men died and that began what has become the largest oil, oil spill, the largest unintentional oil spill in world history and it would be hands down the largest oil spill in world history period had it not been for someone who you really want to be in the same league with, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein in 1991 literally used oil as a weapon and when US troops and British troops were approaching Kuwait, he opened up pipelines and opened up tankers and attacked them with oil. Had he not done that, this would be hands down the largest oil spill in world history, no comparison. So that's a nice league, nice league to be playing in. Um, there is no comparison, 210 million gallons of oil spilled um, and great devastation uh, on the Gulf Coast. Um, when I went down, I started talking to people and started trying to understand uh, all the different dimensions of this story. And of course, the one that, the piece that gripped many of us the greatest was this piece initially. This is a brown pelican, the state bird of Louisiana. Um, the oil as it came out of the Macondo well really um, the, the image that I kept coming up with as I was writing about it and describing it was this, this monster. Like we all finally saw that footage, right, from the bottom of the ocean. It took a long time to see that footage, but we finally got to see that footage. And that footage was this billowing, gushing, you know, beast roaring out of the bottom of the ocean and attacking. And it really attacked. As we went, uh, as I traveled around the Gulf Coast, we started having um, daily oil casts, like weather casts, Where's the oil going to hit today? You know, is it going to come today? What time might it come today? And the military was tracking it and trying to monitor its movements. And you would have this bizarre situation, and it's why we get to this point today when people talk about it today, and some people say it's over, and other people say it's completely devastated where I am, because the oil hit like a hurricane. You see when hurricanes hit and then one house here is standing, and right next to it is complete devastation? That's the way the oil hit. And so there are places that are clean today, and there are other places that are utterly, utterly devastated on the surface, and we'll talk about the bottom in a bit. But the oil attacked, and some of its first um, casualties were the wildlife uh, of the Gulf of Mexico. And this is actually a photograph. I took most of the photographs that I have in my book. Um, an amazing photographer for Greenpeace, God, whose name I'm going to, of course, forget right now, who um, it, I also was gracious enough to, Greenpeace was gracious, en gracious enough to let me use his photographs. He's actually having um, an exhibit of his photographs um, down at the aquarium from the Gulf. It's supposed to be amazing and beautiful and I hope everybody will go see it. He's a brilliant photographer. But this was one that I actually purchased. This was an AP photograph by Charles Rydell that I wanted to make sure that we had. So there are many people who I spoke to, and um, this uh, man was one of the most important. So of course, this whole disaster, much of it was captured in images of um, birds that were oiled in the beginning, and brown pelicans and other oiled, oiled birds. But this began with the death of 11 men. And one of the people who was so um, open and generous with me was Keith Jones. And Keith's son, Gordon, worked on the Deepwater Horizon. Gordon was 28 years old. His nick nickname was Gordo because he was heavy as a child. And Gordon um, 
was only on the rig for, for a one-week tour. He was going to leave the next day. And he was going home because his wife, Michelle, was giving birth to his second son, um, Maxwell Gordon. And he had just celebrated the second birthday of his older son, Samford. And he was going to go home for seven weeks. Uh, he was, of course, very excited. Everyone, he talked about the coming of the birth of his new son endlessly, and everyone knew that it was happening. And the night that the rig exploded, his um, relief, the person who was supposed to relieve him came to show up for his shift, and Gordon said, you know, man, you just look really tired. You just go, 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 go hit the rack. So his friend did, and he went to sleep, and um, shortly thereafter is when the explosion happened, and Gordon was a mud engineer who worked for contractor M.I. Swaco, and he and all the men who died, when they died, they died knowing that they were sacrificing their lives because they all could have left where they were. Where they were was at the heart of the explosion. It's where the gas was coming up into the rig. And by the time the gas was there, they should have been given all kinds of warnings. There should have been alarms that went off. There should have been doors that closed, uh, that locked in their room. So for example, if gas came into this room where we're standing, what should have happened on the rig is automatically all of these doors would seal so that we might die, but the whole building wouldn't explode and the whole block wouldn't explode. And we would also, everyone on the rig would have been given an automatic warning that the gas was entering the rig. Now, the Gulf of Mexico is unique for many reasons, one of which is that it is one of the most difficult places in the world to drill. And that's because it is so gaseous. It has a ton of natural gas. And the gas is, of course, lighter than the oil, and the gas bubbles up regularly. And it goes into the pipe. And if you want to think about what these operations are, um, they're you know, technological wonders. In fact, they're so wondrous that they don't work. But they're technological wonders. And most offshore drilling takes place at 400 feet. So you've got the water, you've got a rig. 400 feet below is the ground, the earth. And then there's a well underneath. And that most drilling takes place there or shallower and has taken place there or shallower. In the last 20 years, the last 10 years, really, the oil industry has pushed and pushed and pushed that horizon. And the deep water horizon was drilling at 5,000 feet. So here's the ocean, 5,000 feet below is the well, and then 13,500 feet below that is where the oil is, or 5,000 feet below is where the surface of the earth is. And uh, the well is very deep and the and the gas bubbles up and the gas kicks against the pipe creates kicks and it creates an unstable well and when you completely lose control of that well it's called a blowout now blowouts have been happening more and more and more they're more frequent in the gulf coast as the industry has moved deeper and deeper and deeper and the guys on the rig knew that this was a really difficult well to drill they actually started calling it the well from hell um, it had actually already been kicking. It kicked another rig off it earlier, the Marianas. It sent the Marianas all the way home. The Marianas was decommissioned, and in came the Deepwater Horizon. Now, the guys on the well, uh, rig knew that it was a difficult well and knew that they were having trouble, but they should have, at that moment that the disaster happened, been given much more warning. And the reason why they didn't is because the alarms on the rig were intentionally inhibited. That means that they recorded information, but they didn't sound. They had been turned off. They had been turned off so that they wouldn't wake up people uh, for false alarms. Also, probably they were turned off because if people are woken up for false alarms, you also have to put in all kinds of money and resources to deal with the fact that the alarm went off. And it seems to me that they didn't want to spend that money. So they weren't alerted. And what we hear in the testimony of people all around the rig is that the gas entered the rig, and it was like this wraith moving through the rig. People felt it go by them. They heard it in their, in their ears. And it writhed around the rig, kind of heralding the exploding doom. And what didn't happen is the alarms didn't go off, and the walls didn't come down. And the guys came in to the point of the well to try and save it and to try and reduce the damage. And, and they didn't succeed in closing in the well. They did fight to their death uh, to, to protect the rest of the rig. And um, Gordon died. So Keith 
has since his son's death made it his mission to make sure that the oil companies involved are held to account and that nothing like this happens, uh, happens again. And um, one of the things that, that he did to help try and see that happen is when I went to London last week for BP's annual shareholder meeting, I was joined by five um, Gulf Coast residents who were there representing their communities that were impacted by the disaster. And one of them was Byron Enkelade, the head of the Louisiana Oystermen's Association. Another was Tracy Coons with the Louisiana Shrimpers Association. And they were leaders from their communities. And we came to London and we did a lot of media. They were really eager to hear what we had to say. Uh, we, we talked to the BBC, we talked to everyone we could. And we finally got to the shareholder meeting and they had proxies to get in and I had shares in BP. And Keith had given me a statement to read because he couldn't come to London to read to the shareholder meeting. And at the shareholder meeting, up on a stage like this, but way bigger, there were like a thousand shareholders, a huge stage, this is an enormous event, was the entire board of directors, the chairman of the board, uh, the new CEO, Bob Dudley, and they had said how important it was to talk about the Gulf Coast and how much they cared about the Gulf Coast. Um, although when I got in, what I found out when I got in is that they cared about the Gulf Coast very, very much, but they wouldn't let a single Gulf Coast resident into the meeting. Every single one of them was denied their proxies, even though they had legal proxies, and they were kept outside in the lobby. I didn't know this until I got in. I got in, I looked around, I looked for them. They're not there. I had gotten in, and the reason why I got separated from them was because I was stuck talking to the, the BP folks who were only going to let me in, uh, even though I'm a shareholder, under a very special condition, which was that I not speak. So <laughs> shareholders are all given the opportunity in a shareholder meeting to address the meeting. It's one of the rights of being a shareholder. So they could, I could go in, but I'm not allowed to speak. So, you know, I argue that a little bit. Anyone who knows me knows that that's sort of a silly idea that you're going to tell me I'm not going to speak. Um, I said, okay, sure, fine, I won't speak. Um, I went in, I found out that the, uh, that the Gulf residents were denied access. I was very angry, I didn't know what I should do. Should I walk out, should I stay? And then I looked down uh, at my, at my uh, folder and I saw Keith's statement and I said, uh, you know, I have to stay and I have to read his statement no matter what. And um, I read his statement and one of the things that Keith says that is repeated over and over again um, in the findings of every investigation into this disaster, what Keith said is, you cut corners, you cut costs, you were greedy, you gambled with my son's life, you rolled the dice with his life and you lost and he died and I'm gonna make sure that that doesn't happen again. And that is mirrored in, this is a statement that was made by one of the survivors of the Deepwater Horizon, one of the few to testify before Congress. His name is Stephen Lane Stone, and he worked for Transocean. Transocean is the owner and operator of the Deepwater Horizon. It's the largest owner and operator of rigs all around the world. Um, of the 126 people on the rig that day, 79 worked for Transocean. Transocean is also responsible for 78% of all of the major incidents that require investigation on deep water rigs around the world because of their poor operations. They work for every single major oil company. BP was the manager on the rig. Transocean was the one that was operating it. And Steven, Steve, Steven said, this event the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon was set in motion years ago by these com companies needlessly rushing to make money faster while cutting corners to save money. When these companies put their savings over our safety, they gambled with our lives. They gambled with my life. They gambled with the lives of 11 of my crew members who will never see their families or loved ones again. The result of the explosion was a fire the result of the fire was that nobody was prepared for the fire. Of the many things that they hadn't prepared for, they hadn't prepared to deal with the fire on a deep offshore rig. The result of the poor response to the fire was that the rig capsized. When the rig capsized, it had, been, it had remained tethered to the pipe, which it shouldn't have been. So this was another problem. There were hundreds of maintenance issues on the deep water horizon that hadn't been taken care of. A couple of them were found within the blowout preventer. So um, let's see. If uh, this is, if the black is the, is the uh, ocean floor and I'm the pipe and the rig is here, <laughs> um, 
at my feet is supposed to be this big device called the blowout preventer, and it sits right hugging the pipe as it goes from earth up to the rig. The blowout preventer is the key device. Everyone knows that the worst thing that can happen on a rig is a blowout. Everyone's supposed to be prepared for it. The blowout preventer is the last piece of equipment that's supposed to protect you. The blowout preventer on the Deepwater Horizon, we found, was having such problems as it was low on batteries. It was leaking hydraulic fluid. It's supposed to be tested every five years. It'd been out there for 10. It had never been tested. This is uh, Sherry Rivette, and her husband was, is Dewey Rivette. And Dewey worked for Transocean, and that, what she's sitting next to, and you can tell I took that picture, <laughs> um, is a helmet that Transocean gave her um, upon Dewey's death. And Dewey was, was in the rig, and Dewey and Gordon and all of the men who died, when they were on the rig floor, they pushed a button that was supposed to start the blowout preventer. And what that would do was basically chop off my legs, given the image that I gave you. It, snaps in, cuts off the pipe, and locks in the well. They push the button, nothing happened. The explosion started happening, they died. Basically, everyone on the rig floor died immediately. Up on the bridge, a young woman, who was really the heroine of the day named Andrea Flatus, first of all noticed that no alarms were sounding and nothing was shutting in, and she pushed the button that made that happen. The next thing she did was call the May Day. Now, she's gotten in trouble for both of those actions because the companies are saying she didn't do either of those things sooner to take away the responsibility for the fact that they had taken away the alarms, and, and they blame it on Andrea. Andrea was the heroine of the day. Um, up on the bridge, they have another opportunity to press the blowout preventer. They pressed it. It didn't, hap it didn't work. What they also have is something called an emergency disconnect. And what that is supposed to do is if the rig is going to blow, it's supposed to disconnect the platform from the pipe so it can be separated. They press the emergency disconnect and psh, nothing happened. So the rig is tethered to this blowing up well. Fortunately, they get off. They can't fight the fire. But the result of the fact that it didn't disconnect is that the rig capsizes and it's tethered to the pipe and it basically uh, splits the pipe. And what we end up with is a pipe that's kinked in several places, and at the kinks is where the leaks happen. So what this means is that we got really lucky. Because had the pipe, remember the visual, had I been completely removed from the well, we would have had a gusher, an explosion. There are 50 million to a billion barrels of oil down there. Only 210 million barrels leaked. We were lucky because the pipe ended up as basically a buffer against the explosion. Now, um, the oil goes out, the men are dead, what happens next? Now, I have the, the um, uh, extreme pleasure of being able to share with you um, on, the many, on, one, on the many trips that I took down to the, to the Gulf Coast. On one trip, was it in August? In August, um, I was with Sandy Siafi, and Greg, I'm going to mispronounce your name, so you can say it. West Hoff, um, and Craig Stratton, Stratton. sorry, uh, you're all, you're, all our names are in the book, so get the book and then you'll be sure to get the names right. Um, Sandy Siafi, among many other things, is a wonderful documentarian who made Sweet Crude, a movie about oil in Nigeria, and she and her team went down with me on one long weekend in August to film some footage, and I've got some of it here, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to play all of it, but it's beautiful, and you'll see the amazing imagery that, that we got from down there. This was in August. Just a, we, only, we only were able to go to a couple places, but you'll get a sense of what it looked like. My name is Antonia Juhas, and I'm the author of The Tyranny of Oil, the world's most powerful industry, and what we must do to stop it. I've been working on corporations and um, oil and the oil industry for over 10 years. On April 20th, 2010, the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig exploded 50 miles off the coast of Louisiana. 
it has become what is the largest unintentional oil spill in world history and arguably the largest environmental disaster in U.S. history. Over three million gallons of oil have spilled so far from the Macondo well. We've learned that it's been more than 60,000 barrels of oil every single day. That's the equivalent of one Exxon Valdez every four days spilling into the deeply fragile and critical uh, ecosystem of the Gulf of Mexico. Looking at the nation as a microcosm, as we've done, globalization has done around the world. We foisted off the bad parts mm -hmm. of our petrochemical dependency on the poor. And in this case, it's the poor of America, mm -hmm. Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of Alaska, and or the poor of the planet, you know, when we outsource to the south to p put up with the pollution so we can have our lifestyle in the north. We expected that when she stopped the oil spill, things would settle down a little bit, but it's somewhat stayed the same, maybe a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. Just because they've capped the oil, so that means the national media is, is taking their spotlight off of the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. So that means VOO skim, uh, has uh, skimmed down. So that means more people are out of work. They open the waters, but you know, like, like I said, the, the seafood safety and the stigma on seafood right now, no one wants to go out. And when you think about this whole industry here, you know, 75% of this industry in, in the bottle of battery is seafood. So, I mean, already they were, out of work for four months, could, you know, could they be out of work for another few years, you know, and could they handle that, you know? And could you imagine a city with only 25% of people are working? Biden's most famous words were, does this look like a disaster? That's yeah, because you're on the beach, it doesn't look like a disaster, but if you come into these communities where 75% of this, the community is sitting at home waiting to do something, waiting to go back to work. They love to use the word disaster when explaining things, but to declare it one, mm -hmm. They're fiddling with thumbs, you know. Not yet, not yet, not yet. When is it? When is it time to call a disaster? You know, because I think this is this is a disaster. You know, it's a crisis. I mean, you look at Katrina; they consider it as a disaster, but it only lasts for like three to months. Yeah, three months. And people are back to work again. Yeah. This thing is over four months already, and people still aren't working. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to call this a disaster. Just behind us are fishing trawlers. They should be being used for fishing. They should have nets on them. Instead, they have what has become the ubiquitous down here in the bayou of Louisiana, oil booms. Orange booms that are used to fish for oil and scoop up oil instead of fish. The booms are, um, their main function is to stop oil from coming onto the coast. Uh, they're, they're kind of effective. But you see, when we have somewhat of choppy weather, if the booms are still on, they're still on this side, you can see it, they would roll, the water would just easily roll over the top. And especially with the underwater oil plumes, they just go right under. Because there might be six inches of a boom that go underwater, and that's, that's what's stopping the oil, but they go under and they go over, so. Dulac is a predominantly Native American population of Right now, I'd say roughly about 6,000 people. And most of our people are fishermen. Um, if they're not fishermen, then for the most part, people work in the oil industry. Um, because again, as indigenous people, we're sort of part of the land and the water. We're generally impoverished down here anyway. Mm -hmm. and But we've always been able to eat. And that's, you know, that's the other thing. Even if people are pretty low income, we've always had food on the table because they've been able to go catch the food. So shrimp, oyster, fish, um, that's always just been in the freezer. We were concerned we wouldn't have um, sh any more shrimp in the freezer, you know, for, for those scarce times. This hurricane season is a very scary one, um, and everyone is scary, but this one is even scarier because even though, again, there's no more oil gushing out, we don't know exactly how much oil is there. Mm -hmm. It's still waiting to be cleaned up. The first time we had water was maybe 20 something years ago. The first time? Yeah, the first time we had flood waters mm -hmm. in this area right. Um, right. was 20 something years ago. Mm -hmm. And then now it's every three to four years and now it's every two years. You know, it seems to be getting worse. And so um, next year we might be worried about the same thing where at one, once upon a time that wasn't an issue because we were protected by the barrier islands. We were protected by wetlands. Um, my grandfather, his family lived on some of the barrier islands that we talk about have disappeared, so. Land that's now gone. Yeah, completely washed away. It doesn't yeah. exist. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's very hard for me to think about, you know, mm -hmm. um, that my grandfather, as, as a child, lived on a place that doesn't exist. It's very, doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. So obviously, the effects of the release of 210 million gallons of oil are that uh, communities all across the Gulf were first um, attacked by the oil itself. Um, 
part of the problem was how the, how the, how the disaster was dealt with. So 210 million gallons were ultimately released. Then in basically a, pro a question of the um, cure being worse than the disease, one of the things we learned in the series of problems that were identified across the course of this disaster, one, the first was no one knew how to deal with the blowout. Two, even though they had all said that they could handle 300,000 gallons of oil being released into the Gulf of Mexico a day, at worst, this was 80,000 barrels a day. And when I was speaking in August, we thought it was 60,000. It was 80,000, we found out, at worst and they didn't know how to deal with it. And one of the things we know that they did was after 1989, after the Exxon Valdez, and just to remember, this spill was the equivalent of one Exxon Valdez every four days. In the response to the Exxon Valdez, they used Corexit, which is the common response to an oil spill. It's what you do, it's what you did. But generally, oil spills are much smaller than this. Generally, and oil spills happen all the time, there will be a small oil spill. You apply a little bit of Corexit, it's a chemical toxin, and it breaks up the oil a little bit and makes it so that birds won't go into it, and it's just sort of a standard practice. Well, one of the things they learned in using this standard practice in the Exxon Valdez disaster was that using it made people incredibly sick because they had to use more of it than they generally do. It was a toxin, and people who got near it got very, very sick. What happened after the Exxon Valdez, where they used the Corexit, they used Boom, they used Skim, and only 14% of the oil was ever recovered, was that the end, one of the things that happened was we organized, people organized in response to the Valdez disaster, and a great piece of legislation was passed called the Oil Pollution Act. And one of the things the Oil Pollution Act did was require that the industry invest in new technology, require that it figure out actually how to deal with an oil spill. 20 years later, we have an oil spill, and what do we find out? They haven't invested a single penny in any sort of new research, any sort of new devices, any new tactics. So what we have is the Corexit again, the exact same Corexit. And they apply two million gallons of the Corexit. And what happened was that they took the same strategy that they usually do with a small spill and applied it essentially, you know, oil for chemical, oil for chemical, so that you have this enormous drenching of the, go of the coast. And the reason for doing it, the reason for applying the Corexit in theory, is that essentially you're sacrificing the ocean for the shore. Oil is toxic. You don't want people to come into contact with it. You don't want am animals to come into contact with it. So they applied it in the ocean. But they kept applying it and kept applying it and kept applying it. And it didn't work because there was so much oil that instead what you had was oil hitting the shore, chemicals hitting the shore. The two each is toxic. The combination of the two is even more toxic. And then you had this, which was the burning of the oil on the surface of the ocean. Now, why did they do this? Um, an interview that I, I would play for you, but I've been talking too long, so I won't, in Sandy's um, film is with one of the BP contractor who spoke there for a moment. And he makes a point very clearly that's very important. Oil, when it is, when it is together, when it is still not dispersed, you can work with it. You can gather it, and you can do something really important. You can suck it up. But you have to suck it somewhere. They were supposed to have ships ready to contain oil that they would suck up, but they didn't. They didn't have that until the very end. So they dispersed it, and when they were able to boom it, they burned it. And so one of the health effects was the this. <laughs> These happened every day for three months, countless numbers every single day. Now, one of the other things that happened was that with the Valdez disaster, one of the things that was incredibly um, moving to the public were the images of the oil birds. And it helped people organize and it made them impassioned and it helped us get to the Oil Pollution Act. Now, one of the things that happened over the course of this disaster, beginning in, from the start, but it got inten intensified as it went on, was that the media was blocked from getting access to the story. And as I said earlier, what, one of the things that happened was that uh, Thad Allen, at uh, the head of the Coast Guard, announced that you couldn't go within 40 feet of boom, you couldn't go within 40 feet of beaches that were oiled, 
And I experienced many times, um, I'd be ready to go out on a boat, someone would be ready to take me out on a boat, they'd find out that I was a writer and they wouldn't take me because they'd be afraid of being uh, charged. Um, what happened was that access was increasingly denied and that those photos of the birds went away and it made us all think there must be less birds getting oiled and I was thinking that. But when I actually looked into the numbers, the numbers of birds and, and wildlife that were being oiled was increasing while the photographs of them were decreasing because access was being denied. And there was this amazing story of these burns were happening every time. These were incredibly um, apocalyptic images. But nobody was given access to fly over them. No one was given access to go out to the rigs. Um, no one was given access, no media, to actually cover this from the site. And the one day that an ABC News reporter was given access to one of the rigs at the spill site was the one day that there were no burns. And so there was no image like this that was captured. Now, part of what happened as a result, to this, uh, as a result of this disaster, um, people are out of work. Uh, of course, the coast is oiled. The American public is gripped. In July, the gusher is spilling. People are organizing. There is all this legislation moving through Congress. And the American public was gripped. This, the media coverage of this disaster was the highest of almost any disaster for the longest period of time ever. And the public always wanted more than they were getting. And all of that attention was translating into policy change. Now, two things happened. The first was the well was capped. Thank God, finally. They learned, they figured it out. It took them three long months, but they finally figured out how to put something on top of it that, that held it. But just an aside on that, even though they put on the cap, they never really felt comfortable with the cap and the well was never really considered done until they drilled the relief well, and that took five months. And what that means is that if this ever happens again, and the conclusion of this story is that it, there's no reason to believe that it won't. There is nothing in any other oil operations to lead anyone to believe that this can't and won't happen again, is that it'll take five months, because that's how long it takes to drill a relief well. You can't do it any faster. And if they go out deeper, it'll take even longer. Um, the second thing that happened, however, because the public was still paying attention and legislation was still moving, the second thing that happened was that Carol Browner, President Obama's climate czar, went on television on August 16th and said to ABC and, and said to NBC and said to CBS, and I quote, the majority of the oil, the vast majority of the oil is gone. And that was absolutely untrue. And the scientists that worked on the document that she was citing said so. The scientists who worked on it, and we have all seen the documents since, said that the report that she was citing said the exact opposite. Seventy percent of the oil remained, thirty percent was gone, and she twisted it on, on its head. And it didn't matter that the next day all the scientists were in the press saying, you twisted it on its head, because the American public turned off our televisions. And one of the reasons why we were sort of given the opportunity to do that was simultaneously the oil industry was working its magic in what will go hands down as one of the best lobbying efforts in the history of the oil industry, which was to one, isolate BP and make this look just only like a BP accident, but not only that, a fluke. And so we could feel rest assured that it was over, everything was fine, and it wasn't gonna happen again, and we turned away and all of the energy stopped. The other thing the industry did, though, just by the way, is that this is after Citizens United, the Supreme Court ruling that made it, that eliminated the restriction on how much money corporations can spend on elections. And prior to this ruling, corporations regularly spent about 11 times more on lobbying than on elections. That isn't because they like lobbying more than elections, it's because there was a restriction. After Citizens United, the amounts doubled, tripled, were already into the quadrupling stage of how much money corporations are spending on elections. And the oil industry poured money into elections, they poured money into lobbying, and they stopped dead every single piece of legislation and not a single one, not a single one has passed. This is now one year later. The reason why we went to London, the Gulf Coast residents and I went to London, was to tell BP what everyone knows in the Gulf, that this isn't over. And one of the amazing people who I follow um, through the course of this book 
is a woman named Dr. Samantha Joy, and she is phenomenal, and she's an amazing scientist, and she's been down to the bottom of the Gulf every time, uh, every month since this disaster happened, and what she has concluded, and what every other scientist has concluded and seen, it's not a conclusion, it's witnessed, is that there is a two-inch layer thick of oil on the bottom of the ocean, there's a layer of chemical dispersant on top of it, and as Jamie Bilyeu said in that interview, what we're really worried about is what's going to happen with the next storm. What's going to wash up? And the oil and the dispersant are still washing up, but what isn't down there, and this is what the fishers went to London to say, is the life that is supposed to be down there. And what also hasn't happened is that BP has not lived up to its moral or its legal or its financial obligation in the Gulf. Of all the claims that have been filed, only a third have been paid out. People live a subsistence on fish that they can't eat. They haven't been paid, as Vin and David said. Uh, they haven't gotten their claims. They haven't been able to get back to work. And Vin, uh, who, who was uh, one of the men uh, in Sandy's uh, video, Vin is um, a Gulf War, uh, a, an Iraq War veteran. Uh, he was basically born in a crabbing facility. He got out of the crabbing facility when he joined the Navy and went to Iraq, but he had to come back because of Hurricane Katrina to help his family. He was just getting ready to leave, and then the oil hit, and he had to come back. And that story is repeated over and over and over again. The other message that we went to, to deliver was that we said to BP, we know this isn't just a problem that you, with you. This is a problem with the entire industry. And this is what is so critical and where I will leave you with here. I live in California. You live in Washington. We have a moratorium on offshore drilling in our states. The only reason why we have that moratorium is because in 1969, when there was a blowout, an offshore blowout off the coast of Santa Barbara, people organized. They organized and they achieved within one year the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, Earth Day, and 11 long years later, a moratorium on new offshore drilling. President Bush lifted that moratorium. President Obama was all set to implement the lifting of that moratorium when at the very last minute he saved our coast, he sacrificed the Atlantic, he sacrificed Alaska, and he kept the drilling in the Gulf Coast. But we just inched by, eked by. The oil industry wants to drill here. It wants to drill where I live, and it will keep pushing for it. And what the moral of this story is is that they don't know how. And so our responsibility as parents, like Keith, is to say is to be the parent to the oil industry and to say we know you want it but you can't have it there are places that you can't go there we know we're dependent on your resource and for as long as we're dependent on your resource we are going to be in charge of it and we are going to say if you have to kill people or fight wars to get it or be in places where there are extreme environmental consequences of your operations you cannot go there and then we will regulate and rein in the rest of the operations that you have until we make you irrelevant and move past you. And uh, that, and it is with that that I that I that I end this talk and say, you know, um, um, I, I hope that you'll read these stories. I hope that you'll take them with you because the other thing I want to say is, when I um, toured the tyranny of oil two years ago, and oil prices were at $150 a barrel, and people were deeply concerned with gasoline and oil and the oil industry, there was tremendous um, enthusiasm about talking about the issues around oil. This crisis is a human crisis that continues, but the world has told us, the, admin, the Obama administration, the oil industry has told us that it's, we can just move on, that it's over and not pay attention. And it is the responsibility of those of us who know that it is ongoing and know that this is an ongoing problem within the oil industry to be the messengers and to speak up for those in the Gulf and to say uh, this is a problem that continues today that we will fight for them for. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, There is no way to file a claim against BP for health effects. It's been tried. And they go, no, we don't have the forms. So how do people who are suffering, and the suffering is horrendous, people in the hospital, I have heard, um, I don't have it documented, that there have been 50 some people who have died as a result of working on the oil thing. One captain had 
four of his crew members die. Three out of four, sorry, three out of four die. Um, the, the effects are absolutely horrendous. There's, there's um, heart effects, there's um, effects of the um, shaking, there's rashes, there are infections, there's bleeding from the rectum, mm -hmm. any, you name it. Mm -hmm. And they've given it a name. It's called tilt. Um, uh, let's see. And I can't, for the life of me, I can't remember mm -hmm. what tilt stands for. It has to do with not being able to defend your own system any longer. You are, um, I have it at my desk. But mm -hmm. um, okay. how do we get BP to pay attention to the effects on people's health. Thank you. Um, yes, there have been extreme uh, health consequences, and let me just reference you to an amazing woman, um, Dr. Wilma Subra, who's one of the women who I follow through the course of the book. She's with a group called the Louisiana Environmental Action Network. She has been at the forefront on the ground for decades in Louisiana, monitoring the health effects of the petrochemical industry. And from the, from the outset, she has been at the forefront of addressing the health effects of this crisis and continues to monitor them. Um, also, the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, which has been tracking the um, effects uh, on the air uh, in Louisiana and the effects on people's uh, health as well. Um, so let's see, there's two pieces. One is the health effects, it's no longer the responsibility of BP. Um, the good news is that BP, the reason why there was a claims process in the first place is because of the Oil Pollution Act. And just to say in terms of activism, each of these p steps that I've mentioned along the way that have been achieved, the first one was achieved under Nixon, the next was achieved under Reagan, and the next was achieved under the first Bush. So we are not facing anything difficult in trying to push for changes now. The Oil Pollution Act required that if there's an oil spill, the oil company involved has to set up a claims process for economic loss. Um, BP made that process so incredibly cumbersome. And David and Vin in that video, who are two people who I follow in incredibly closely in the book and who were amazing, David and Vin are in Biolabatry, Alabama, population about 2,500, primarily Vietnamese and Cambodian refugees who work in the seafood processing industry. They, have all, they also work for a group called Boat People SOS. And they basically became the people who for their entire community had to try and slug through the BP claims process. David is 25 years old, Vin is 26 years old, and they, basically 400 people a day coming through their office who didn't speak English, who were out of work, who didn't have money, they were figuring out the BP claims process, which meant, which they couldn't. And it was so broken that an independent claims adjuster, Kenneth Feinberg, took it over. It has remained broken. As I said, only a third of the claims have been paid out. Now people are trying to figure out a way to get health effects into that. So if you've had to pay money to get your health care, to work that into the claims process. But it wasn't automatically in the process. And people have, as you say, um, there's something called the BP cough. There is, um, within people's lungs, neurological disorders, respiratory disorders, um, skin, a constant skin peeling. Your skin just peels off and peels off and peels off and peels off. Um, and these health problems are being documented and it's been incredibly difficult to get any care um, and definitely one of the messages that was bringing, being brought to BP and brought to um, Washington was the need to find a way to address the health, ongoing, ongoing health crisis. But I don't have a good answer for you. The answer is we haven't yet. Yeah. I'm really happy that Sandy Chaffee's doing a film about the Gulf because her movie Sweet Crude is extraordinary. And one of the things that was coming up at the time of the spill was that the people in Nigeria, which is this location of her film, we're saying, well, hello, we've been doing, dealing with this kind of environment for years and years and years, and no one's ever gotten upset about it. Uh, and it's, it's true that there are these kinds of environments all over the world caused by a lot of the things that you've discussed. So uh, what I'm wondering about is um, we need to, I mean, we can't go on raping the planet to get oil, period. And, Aside from the disaster on the human race now, 
it's an overwhelming question to move beyond oil. And of course, BP had that stupid slogan. Beyond petroleum. <laughs> but I'm wondering, mm -hmm. in terms of advocacy, you know, how can, isn't there some way that we can reconceptualize this problem? I realize that we have to address the issues that you're talking about, but I'd like to ask you, as an informed person, how to reconceptualize this to say, let's not use oil. That's an absolute. And obviously, um, one of the things, as you said, Sandy's movie documents this extremely well, the um, disasters in Nigeria, but as you say, these, are, these oil disasters happen all over uh, the world and all across the country. Um, and in addition, we have economic costs. So right now, we have $120 a barrel oil. We have gasoline uh, that is much more expensive than it was a year ago. But just to make a point, we are producing more oil in the United States right now at this time this year than we were at this time last year. But the price of everything, hmm? Tar sand. That's from Canada. And we're also getting tar sand oil from Canada. Um, but the price is obviously significantly higher. And the way the oil industry looks at us right now is that we are in an oil glut. The same is true for the world. The world is an oil glut. There's too much oil. And that is uh, a problem that they, as they see it. Um, yet the price is skyrocketing and the price of gasoline is skyrocketing. And the problem with that is that when, the, when those prices rise so dramatically and so out of control, our economies also go into a tailspin. And basically every time oil in the history of oil has gone to $100 a barrel, which is three times, the world goes into recession. So not only can we not afford to continue to be dependent on this resource because of the human rights effects, the environmental effects, the health effects, the political effects, our economy simply cannot handle being hardwired to oil and hardwired to oil anymore. And so we have to figure out all the ways that we can get past it. Um, to me, the most important investment is public transportation. Um, we have the ability to create a massive jobs program, just like we made our investments in a massive highway program, we can make investments in a massive public transportation program, put people to work, and make it possible for people to have alternatives to cars, which is our primary hands down in the United States use of oil and gas, 70%. We have to move away from our cars. But we're already doing it, and that's, that's the good news. We're using less gasoline, we're demanding more fuel efficient vehicles, hybrids, electric cars, but we have to move past them altogether. Alternative energy investments. When I first went to the Gulf of Mexico, not a single environmentalist would even say anything negative about the oil industry. The, they are so um, afraid of the power of the industry that even environmentalists wouldn't talk against the industry. Now, part of that fear is, is false, and that's one of the things that came out in our ability to actually be able to investigate the use and, and wealth of, of um, oil in the Gulf Coast. Um, Louisiana thinks of itself as a petrostate. A petrostate is Angola, where 86% of the GDP comes from oil. A petrostate is Iraq, where 90% of the GDP comes from oil. In Louisiana, 8% of the GDP comes from oil. This is not a petrostate. But the power of the industry is such that people feel captured by it. What happened over the course of this disaster is that people were overwhelmed by the disaster. People who worked in the oil industry also discovered that it wasn't just them when they saw that the rigs were operating in unsafe ways and corners were being cut. It wasn't just their experience. It turns out that was the experience for the entire industry and that permeated the industry. And every investigation that has looked into this industry has found that it is a systemic problem with the industry, endemic within the industry, and everyone in the oil industry was able to see that, and the workers were able to see that. And by the end of my time down there, oil workers were saying, give us something else to do. We would like to not do this anymore. We would like to not be drilling. It's unsafe. Let us build wind turbines. Let us, in, let us build solar panels, give us an alternative energy industry and we will embrace it. But they also said, we can't fight for it here because Louisiana controls our politics, the oil industry controls our politics. You in the liberal states have to do it. You in Washington have to do it. You in California have to do it. You have to do it for us. And that will help us make the transition. But let me just say, as an anti-oil activist, 
I'm also realistic. We can't be off this resource tomorrow, which means that while we are dependent on it, it is deeply our responsibility to hold this industry in check as much as we possibly can because we will remain dependent on them. And so as long as we're dependent on them, we have to take responsibility for them. And one of the stories that kept, I kept being reminded of while I was writing this book was um, Enron. Enron's energy traders are famously quoted as saying when they were forcing up the price of electricity and no one was regulating them, we, we were like kids on a playground and there were no parents. And we knew what we were doing was illegal, we knew it was immoral, but we did it anyway because we could. And that's what it felt, feels like to me with the oil industry uh, as well. What about Jason? Um, Jason is, is, is one of the oil workers who I interviewed, and uh, I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go into this story right now. He's an amazing, am, amazing, amazing person who gave me amazing stories, but not, not related to the chain of thought that we're on right now, so I don't want to put words into his mouth that he didn't give me. <laughs> Certainly, I cover extensively uh, this relationship between the Obama administration, the Coast Guard, um, and BP. Um, and I sent, there's two things that happened. Um, one was that basically the more that Obama went out in the public uh, in response to this disaster, the lower his poll numbers fell. And as that became clear, he stopped going out in the public uh, in response to this disaster and stopped being out front, if he ever was, but stopped putting himself out front. Um, one, he didn't want his poll numbers to go down, but two, he had other things that he cared about and he was very concerned about his poll numbers going down. So healthcare, um, the economy, you name it, um, it, was, it was not working out for him to be out front on this issue. And the other piece that was happening was that it turns out that the federal government has no expertise on this issue at all. It doesn't. Um, the regulations that we have in place that are, involve both the Coast Guard and the Interior Department for offshore drilling were written in 1969 when a deep water well was at 400 feet. They were written by the industry and they haven't been updated essentially. And there is no expertise uh, within the federal government. There is no staff. There is no uh, oversight capability. And that you know, travesty of a situation meant that the perpetrator of the crime was put in charge of cleaning up the crime. And the Coast Guard, uh, you can see charts. The, the reason why the Coast Guard was there and the reason why the system operated the way it was was because after the, the Oil Pollution Act actually creates this um, sort of quasi-military structure for dealing with oil spills and the Coast Guard is in charge, um, but at every level it was really BP ahead of the Coast Guard, occasionally the Coast Guard would be in charge and the reason for that was decisions that the Obama administration made but also the nature of the beast which is that our federal government is totally incapable of regulating this industry.